Welcome back. I'm Jake Fowler. This is the Paleocrat Diaries on the Meaning of Catholic. And we are brought to you today partly by beer, but also by Our Lady's Closet. I'll get to that in just a moment. This is part 17, I believe, of the Ecumenical Councils. And today we're looking at the Council of Hyaria up to, possibly through, the Council of Nicaea II, Second Council of Nicaea, which was held in 787. So I left you last time. We had looked at uh, the accession of Constantine V and his initial reign, where he was promoting iconoclasm. Mm, not great. And right as we concluded, I sort of hinted that there's more iconoclasm to come before the council, and then even then after the council. Before we get into all that, take a look at this. Yes, there we go. These, what you see on your screen right now, those are dresses that my wife made and continues to make. If your daughter would look good in one of these dresses, if it would lift her mind to God, to Our Lady, to the saints, then please patronize Our Lady's Closet. You can find her on Etsy.com. A quick search, Our Lady's Closet. It'll pull it right up. These are the summer dresses. There's going to be a new batch for fall, and these won't be available. So it's in your best interest, if you like these styles, to act now. Be sure to follow her on Instagram and Facebook, at Our Lady's Closet. This is the way to support the Fowler family. I don't have a Patreon. Probably not going to start one. I don't know. I might. I might. I might not. I'm not sure. Doesn't matter because this is in place. This is in place. So if you like the Paleocrat Diaries, if you support the Kaiser, and you want to support the docent, then you can go once more to Etsy.com and find Our Lady's Closet. Okay. I think that's good. There we go. Music. It is pleasant. You know, I let it play a little longer this time. It's almost over. How much more? Ah, too long. Okay. <laughs> there we go. A little sip of shalafly as I locate my outline. We left off in about the year 752, 752 AD, and we had been discussing Constantine V. Now, there were some changes, let's say, to the demographic of the empire. If you recall from the tail end of part 16, we talked about how Constantine brought from the fringes of the empire what was newly reconquered territory into the heart of uh, Rome. Well, not Rome, the city, but the empire. These Monophysite Christians and some other weird sects and people with just strange beliefs. And it sort of shook up the demographics in the imperial, uh, well, in and around the capital in the heart of the empire. Now, as he did this, he's bringing in interesting strains of thought, some of which are very iconoclastic. He himself was an iconoclast, and the emperor took it upon himself to circulate what I'm going to call an encyclical. They wouldn't have called it that back then, uh, and it's not technically an encyclical because clearly it's not written by the pope, but it's a letter it was meant to be circulated, so the description works. And he, what, he, what he does in this encyclical, Constantine V, is that he really solidifies the position of the iconoclasts by authoring this theological treatise, explaining and defending all of its doctrine, or at least on this one point. I'm quite sure that he expected all of the bishops to go along with it, to sign it, 
as they had always been expected to. Now, in contrast to his father, Leo III, Constantine does not begin with the Old Testament prohibition on idolatry. Rather, he takes his starting point from Christology. Christology, excuse me. And he says, if Christ is surely one person with two natures, right? Constantine V is a Chalcedonian. And these two natures are joined in such a way as to be inseparable one from the other. After the union, okay, so far so good. So he's saying, upon the incarnation, when God the Word takes on human nature and becomes man in the womb of the Virgin, that there's one person with two natures, two natures after the union. That's good as opposed to Eutychius, recall, who was the heretic condemned at Chalcedon, who said two natures before the union and one after. That's incorrect. It's, it's flipped. Constantine recognizes that. He's a Chalcedonian. It's one before, the divine nature, and it's two after. Constantine uses Chalcedonian themes... But he doesn't use the Chalcedonian language. Instead, he uses uh, the word prosopon, which can be translated person, to indicate what he meant. He says, one person out of two natures. Now, that's technically correct, but it could be a little misleading. Out of two natures is uh, something that a monophysite might say. As in, this one new thing was fashioned out of these two natures, the divine and the human. They came together as one, and now it's sort of mixed and mingled. To depict Christ, therefore, in the mind of Constantine V, is off the table. Because either, on the one hand, you're claiming to depict the divine nature, which is impossible, Or you're claiming to only depict his human nature. On the one hand, it's just, it can't be done. You can't depict pure divinity. And on the other hand, if you say, well, I'm only depicting his human nature, what you've done is you've introduced a division in the person of Christ. And Constantine says, that's a false image, and it's a little bit Nestorian, And that was condemned at Chalcedon. Now, oddly enough, Constantine V does not use the term Theotokos. So he condemns, well, tangentially, indirectly, condemns Nestorianism, but then won't use the term that Nestorius wouldn't use. It's kind of interesting, a little curious, perhaps. Whatever the case... Constantine, uh, the conclusion for him is clear. There can be no Christ icons. This cannot happen. It's just not a thing. And the only way we can represent Jesus is through the image that he himself left us, namely, the Holy Eucharist. This is the thing, the material thing, that he left in order for us to depict him to us to have an image of him, and it only occurs in the context of the liturgy at which he himself is working, right? It's Christ working through the priest at Mass and the divine liturgy to bring about the reality in the sacrament. So it's not an icon made by human hands. To further this doctrinal statement... Constantine summons what he considers to be an ecumenical council. He wanted it to be ecumenical because he wanted to impose this brand of iconoclasm on the rest of the Roman Empire. And so the invitations were sent out, and 338 Eastern bishops responded. They attended this what, what turns out to be a purely Eastern Synod, held in the town or the city of Hyaria, which is north of Chalcedon, 
which would be just across the Bosporus from Constantinople. The first session of this council met February 10th, 754, and it deliberated for about six and a half months. They were finished towards the end of August or maybe early September of that same year. Now, this this council, if you will, which intended was intended to be ecumenical, had zero rep- representation from any of the patriarchates. The see of Constantinople was vacant. Rome didn't attend, didn't even send legates. And the Oriental patriarchates, that would be Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem, nobody sent a delegation from there either. They were in Mohammedan territory anyway. Word may or may not have reached them, but there was no representation. So none of the five patriarchs even have a a delegate or a legate there. Despite this, as I mentioned, over 300 Eastern bishops attended, which makes the Council of Hyeria one of the largest gatherings of the church, of the church hierarchy, that is, in the ancient world, second only to perhaps Chalcedon. Uh, Some sources say there were over 500 bishops at Chalcedon. The other councils, to the best of my knowledge, don't exceed that of Nicaea I, which was 318. So Hyaria is over that, below Chalcedon. It's a big deal, but it's only Eastern bishops and only the ones who are willing to play ball with Constantine V's letter, which promotes iconoclasm. Now, the six and a half months worth of discussion, they weren't debating back and forth whether or not they should condemn images. That was sort of already a done deal. That discussion didn't last very long at all. The bishops seemed to have caved on that point. But rather what took so long was that Constantine also attempted to undermine the previous six ecumenical councils. Why would he do that? Well, it seems that according to those councils, there was at the very least the principles in play that would render iconoclasm an error. So we have to kind of get to the heart of the matter. This isn't entirely uncommon, even in our own day. You will meet Christians, mostly non-Catholic, non-Orthodox, right? So I'm referring to Protestants in general. Some people don't like labels, whatever. I kind of like labels. Mostly Protestant Christians who will undermine all of the councils that the church has ever held, even the ones that are really good, because they don't want to have to admit that there's a structure of authority there. They don't want to have to admit, well, okay, Nicaea 1 taught about the Trinity, and that's really good. Well, does that mean these bishops actually have authority to teach then? And so they have to undercut the council because of the underlying principles that are at play. Constantine V is doing the same thing for the first six general councils. Now, he's clearly not a Protestant, but he doesn't like the fact that the hierarchy speaks on these matters and lays down these principles. Because I think part of him had to have known that iconoclasm isn't orthodox. That's what makes a heretic obstinate. They know it's wrong, according to the church, and they persist. Hmm. So... The bishops, in their discussions about the prior six general councils, this is what took so long. Now, although they caved in on the iconoclasm bit, they stood firm against the emperor's attempt to undermine those previous meetings, those previous councils. And for this, we should be grateful. Obviously, they made the wrong call regarding images and icons and and the like. But we can be thankful. We can say, well, at least they didn't go that far. At least they didn't undo all of the other councils, at least on paper. You and I know they wouldn't have actually undone anything. Now, 
at the end of it, the council declares that icons are blasphemous for basically the same reasons that we had previously discussed in Constantine's encyclical. They say to depict Christ's person is to say the divine nature is able to be circumscribed and physically represented, anathema. To depict Christ's human nature alone is to introduce divisions where there are none. In other words, Nestorianism, anathema. Hieria also condemned two of the loudest proponents of images, two iconodules, St. John Damascene, or, or John of Damascus, and the patriarch Germanus of Constantinople. Remember, Germanus was the one, he was an old man, probably 90-something, and he was allowed to retire under Leo III when he wouldn't go along with Leo's new heresy. Naturally, when word got around that Constantine V held this Eastern Council, wherein they condemn images and sacred art and St. John Damascene, the West rejected it. The Oriental patriarchates rejected it. Only Constantinople accepted it. And only because the new patriarch, I mentioned the seat was vacant, the new patriarch was one of those present at the final session of the Council of Hieria. After the Council, despite the rejection by the West and the Oriental provinces, Constantine V didn't fly into a rage. He, he didn't amplify persecution, at least not at first. Not at first. In the interim, the external threats were still too great to focus his attentions internally on this matter in particular, except against monks. There were several years between 754 and about 761 where things were pretty calm. But in 761, two fairly famous monks, famous back then anyway, were killed in the public circus, presumably for refusing to submit or subscribe to the Council of Hieria. These monks were iconodule. They adored, well not adored, they venerated the icons. They adored Christ through this action. And Constantine doesn't like that, and they were quite notable. So they have to go. They were killed. The next year, 762, a whole host of monks were forced to remove their habits. In fact, the wearing of religious habits was outlawed by Constantine V. How ridiculous. Monks can no longer wear habits. They were forced to wear the clothes of laymen and to walk through the streets, get this, holding a woman's hand. That doesn't sound like a big deal to us. Some of you may be chuckling. I chuckled when I read it. But to them, what a public humiliation that would be. You've dedicated your life to Christ as a celibate. And now you have to don lay clothes and parade through the streets holding hands with a woman. And it's been said, as a matter of fact, that Constantine V also arranged these phony marriage ceremonies, very public, very humiliating, for these same guys, or at least other monks. They would, they would have monks and nuns, you know, in the public forum, and they would force them to get married, again, to try to break their spirit, to try to get them to embrace iconoclasm. An immense humiliation. Immense. Now, the patriarch who was elected uh, to fill the vacant see of Constantinople, the guy who was at the final session of Hieria, his name was Constantine. So we have Patriarch Constantine, Emperor Constantine. The Patriarch Constantine, even he could not avert the wrath of the emperor. Now, what he did to cross Constantine V will become clear momentarily. But 
For now, suffice it to say, he was deposed and exiled. A short time later, he was brought back to Constantinople and beheaded. His head was mounted to the doors of the Patriarchal Palace. Constantine, the emperor, is sending a message. But what? What did he do? The successor to Patriarch Constantine, Niketas I, upon ascending the Patriarchal throne, he promptly removed all the icons from the Patriarchal Palace. It seems that Constantine the Patriarch was an iconoduel, not an iconoclast, or at the very least, he didn't care enough about the emperor's edicts to do anything with the sacred art in his own home. And it wasn't long before the emperor found out. And what happened? Well, you defy the emperor, you lose your head. Around that same time, Constantine V outlawed intercessory prayer to the saints, and he began destroying relics. Among other atrocities, the body, the relics of Saint Euphemia, who I believe, I, I forget exactly which church she was associated with, I want to say Chalcedon, the Basilica in Chalcedon. Her body was thrown into the sea. Her relics were blasphemously just discarded, tossed away, because you ought not venerate sacred art. I guess they considered her to be sacred art. This sort of thing continued until Constantine V's death in September of 775. It was the 14th. September 14th. He died of disease, and his son, Leo IV, took his place as emperor. Leo IV ruled with his wife, who was an Athenian woman. She was orthodox. She was an icon of duel, although she probably kept quiet about it because her husband, Leo IV, was an iconoclast. This woman's name is Irene. They ruled together. Well, he ruled and she was there for five years, between 775 and 780. In that span, nothing really changed. Leo IV wasn't as severe as his father, Constantine, but he was still an iconoclast, and he did still officially uh, have the same policies that Constantine V did. Upon his death in 780, the succession passed to Leo and Irene's son, Constantine VI. So, from the beginning of this century, we had Leo III, then Constantine V, then Leo IV, and now Constantine VI, and it's the year 781, thereabouts. But Constantine VI is but a boy. He's 10, maybe 11 years old at the time of his father's death, and Irene rules as empress mother, the regent, for the boy emperor, until he can come of age. This is actually pretty standard. Now, before we go any further with the East, I want to say a few things about the West. The situation in the West drastically changed around the time of the Council of Hyaria, you see, the Pope in 752, Stephen, he was seeking the assistance of the Byzantines against the Lombards, who were threatening Rome and, and northern and central Italy. The Lombards were a barbarian tribe who were mostly Aryan, initially anyhow, and they settled in northern Italy in the late 500s, the, the last half of the, of the 500s. 
So somewhere around, I believe, 568. And from then on, you have Lombard presence in Central Europe. And they're not exactly friendly with the Byzantines, and they're not exactly friendly with the Franks. Now, Pepin, who had taken over rule of the Frankish kingdom after the death of his father, Charles Martel, Pepin and Charles Martel were not kings. They were what's called the mayors of the palace. So like the, the chief steward or something, the royal minister. And Pepin wants to know from the Pope, you know, is it right that the guy who rules, that's me, Pepin, isn't actually the king? We have a king here, Childric III. He's from the Merovingian line, the line going back to Clovis I in the 480s. But he's not really doing anything, and these Merovingians are maybe a little bit inbred, and for some reason he never cut his hair, so it's really long, and it's kind of weird. What do you think, Holy Father? Do you think that's the kind of guy that should be king of the Franks? Or should it be the one who actually is in charge of the kingdom, who does the business? And naturally, the Pope said, well, let him who rules have the title of ruler. So with papal approval, Childric III, king of the Franks, is out. And Pepin, Pepin the Short, I believe, he's in. So the Merovingian dynasty comes to an end in the 750s. And the Carolingian dynasty, so named, uh, after Charles Martel, Charles, Charles the Great, Charlemagne, etc., all the Charleses in that line, the Carolingians. This occurs around the same time Constantine V is holding his iconoclast council in Hyaria. The Pope sent Boniface, missionary, who was an Englishman, I think I mentioned him last time, Boniface was an English monk who came to Central Europe to re-evangelize some of the Catholics who, you know, their faith was a little lukewarm, perhaps, and also to reach out to those barbarian tribes, specifically the German tribes, who had not yet converted. Boniface is commissioned by the Holy Father to go and crown Pepin, king of the Franks. This is the formal inauguration, as I mentioned a moment ago, of the Carolingian dynasty. And the, these are the beginnings of what would soon become the Holy Roman Empire. Due to the religious ramifications of iconoclasm, the papacy and the West in general were increasingly isolated and alienated from, from the East. The political and cultural consequences here cannot be understated. This alliance that has existed for centuries between Rome and Constantinople is now very, very weak. Rome, instead of relying on the East, turns to the North for support. And this is yet another factor that would contribute to the Great Schism. Pepin died in the year 768. He left his two sons in charge of the kingdom, Charles and Carloman. And this was customary, I should mention. Why did he leave it to two and not just the oldest? Well, this was the Frankish tradition. When the king died, usually by the end of the king's life, there was only one. Because typically people don't die right at the same time. So the, the ruler, the king, would leave his kingdom divided by territory to however many sons. And over time, whichever son died, his territory would be taken up by one of the remaining survivors, right? And so typically by the end of 
one of their lives, excuse me, by the end of a generation, there's only one guy left and he's got all the territory. Now, this form of royal succession sort of kind of tends to maybe a little bit of fratricide. You could see how that might work. Nonetheless, it's Frankish custom. And it's not just the Franks, it's, it's Germanic custom. And Pepin does this. Upon his death, Carloman and Charles receive their portions. Charles had Neustria, Neustria, I'm not sure how to say that, which is the West, and Carloman had Austrasia, which is the East. Carloman died very suddenly in 771, leaving Charles the sole ruler of the Frankish kingdom. This Charles is Charles the Great, Charlemagne. He consolidated his power and expanded his territory all through the 770s and provided protection for the Pope, who by this time is Hadrian. Hadrian's been reigning since 772 and has actually quite a long pontificate, 772 to 795. He provides protection for the Pope from the Lombards, from the Byzantines, and he solidifies the alliance between the Franks and the papacy that was begun with his father, Pepin. All right. Oh, I should mention, yes, one other thing. Uh, the territory. So when Pepin the Short was assisting the Holy Father with his Lombard problem. He actually had to come down and cross the Alps twice to conquer the Lombards twice because the first time when they said they would play nice with the people of Rome, they actually didn't. And the Franks had to come back and kick their tails again. That second time, Pepin guaranteed the Pope territories in central Italy. And those were the basis that formed the core of what would later be the Papal States. Okay, moving on. In 781, after the death of her husband, Leo IV, the Empress Mother Irene, ruling as regent for Constantine VI, she sent a delegation to Charles the Great. She wants to reopen communications with the West, and she has a proposal, literally. She proposes that her son, Constantine, marry Charlemagne's daughter, Rotruda. Irene was Orthodox, and she wanted to rectify the iconoclast controversy. She wants to right the ship. She wants to reunite with the western half of the church. She did this uh, on advice from the Patriarch of Constantinople, Niketas, the man who succeeded the beheaded Constantine, he died in 780. And the man who took his place was Paul. Paul was an iconoclast. However, he was insincere. He knew it was wrong the whole time, he just wanted to keep his job, and he thought that's how you do that. On his deathbed, or, or near the time of his dying, he summons the empress and informs her that the jig is up, iconoclasm is bunk, we need to get rid of this thing. By the way, we've been out of communion with Rome and the West this whole time because of our beliefs here. And we need to change it. You need to call an ecumenical council. You need to write to the Pope. You need to get him on board and fix this problem. Paul was an old man with a conscience. The end was near. And this seems to me to be his attempt at repenting, at least to some degree. The following year, after Paul's death, 785, Irene sends word to Pope Hadrian that she desires to call an ecumenical council. She intends to summon it to address the iconoclast heresy, and she wants his participation. She wants legates. 
She wants papal legates who will act as representatives and rubber stamp her version of orthodoxy. Hadrian has other things in mind. He replies with a letter, and he lays out his position very clearly. If there is to be a council, the expectations are as follows. Number one, the council must condemn the Council of Hieria. Number two, you must restore seized papal lands in Sicily and Calabria, the southern portion of Italy. Three, the empress must restore papal jurisdiction over the provinces that were illegitimately taken by Leo III and given to the jurisdiction of Constantinople. Ecclesiastical jurisdiction. Irene consented to these conditions. And the invitation was sent out to all the bishops to gather in Constantinople the following year in 786. Now, in the meantime, Irene wants to replace Paul, the patriarch of Constantinople. Who had died. She needed a man who was orthodox. She needed someone who would be faithful to her desires. This isn't uncommon. Emperors do this. Empresses do this, evidently. They want people who think like them. Who doesn't? And she found somebody. Tarasios. Tarasios was a layman. He was a very able administrator. And he was orthodox. Now, before he accepted the position. He wanted to ensure that he had the support of his would-be suffragan bishops. So he gets them all together in some kind of meeting, and he delivers an address to them explaining the legal status of many of the eastern seas, of which surely they were a part. Surely they were the head of some of these seas in the east. He says, look, because of iconoclasm, we have been out of communion with Rome. That's not good. We need to fix that. This is unacceptable, and a council is needed. And I am willing to be your patriarch. But I need to know that you support me, you support reconciling with the West, and you support condemning iconoclasm. Tarasius was successful in persuading those bishops they rallied around him, and they indicated that they would support, in fact, all of the things that he brought up. So, Tarasius writes to Hadrian to inform him of his election. This is customary. They write these synodical letters. They send them around here and there. By the way, Paul died. Yeah, I know. It's me. I was elected. It's going to be awesome. Hadrian's reply, however... It was a little cool, you might say. He replied to Tarasius and Irene in October of 785, and he gave the conditions that I mentioned above, but he also says, um, Tarasius, you're a layman. That's not good. He reproached him because he wasn't a cleric, and he assumed the patriarchal throne. And he also levels a very sharp criticism of Tarasius's use of the term universal patriarch. It's sort of like stepping on Hadrian's toes. He's the universal patriarch. The Pope is the bishop of bishops, right? He's the vicar of Christ on earth. And there can only be one universal patriarch. Despite his objections to Tarasius' situation and the title, Hadrian did, in fact, send legates to Constantinople. Now, when all of the bishops arrived in August of 786, they were soon met by a contingent of iconoclast soldiers. I mean, it was like the first day, first session. Tarasius is getting ready to speak, 
And boom, here come these soldiers. They rush into the basilica and they threaten to do him harm and probably the others there as well, unless they broke up the council and refused to hold it. They basically, the soldiers would not allow these discussions to take place. The bishops had no choice but to disband and return to their sees until another solution could be implemented. Irene and her trusted advisor, a man named Staurasius, they quickly realized that the army is still full of iconoclasts, the army who's loyal to her late husband, Leo IV. And they're desirous for a strong military leader like Constantine V was. And they look at the boy emperor and they kind of chuckle and think, him, this guy, he's got all kinds of problems. He's not a strong leader. We need a strong leader. We don't want your iconodule theology. We want the iconoclasm of Leo III and Constantine V. We were winning battles when they were emperor. So the bishops go home, and the council disbands. It it never really did anything. Irene and Staurasius devise a plan, though. They're going to take soldiers in the capital who are loyal to Leo IV and who are iconoclast and give them a transfer somewhere on the frontier. doesn't really matter. Far away. And they're going to take soldiers far away who would be loyal to Irene, who don't mind uh, Iconodulia. And they'll bring them near and station them in Constantinople. That way we'll all be safe. So they did the old switcheroo with the troops, moving them depending on their beliefs here and there, get the iconoclasts far away. And the following year, the summonses were issued once more. The bishops were recalled from their sees to convene at Nicaea. About 350 bishops from east and west. So now we're trumping the Council of Hieria, still not quite at Chalcedon levels. 300 bishops east and west. There were, it seems, eight Sicilians, six Calabrians, The papal legates were recalled from Sicily. Representatives from Antioch, Alexandria joined as well. In other words, Nicaea too has all of the makings of a real ecumenical council. Roman legates, patriarchal participation, bishops from the east and the west, summoned by the empress with the approval of the pope, Okay. In the early church, we're checking all the boxes. Let's see what Nicaea 2 produces. And let's see that next time. Mm. This was fun. I like it. I like talking about the 700s. We're almost to the 800s, though. And they're also kind of interesting. Very fun. People lose their heads. People drink out of other people's heads. But I don't want to give too much away. Where have we been? Well, we've eclipsed another mm, 35 years, give or take, from 752 to 787. We're right at the doorstep of Nicaea II, as promised. We got there. Next time, we'll look at the council in the aftermath. And then in part 19, we'll look at a little bit of the first half of the 800s. I'm not quite sure where we're going to cut this thing off. The goal is Vatican II, but that's going to take a while. And some other series of mine are going to intervene. Nonetheless, this has been great, and I appreciate your attention. Before I go, I would be remiss if I didn't mention once more the unofficial official sponsor of this program, Our Lady's Closet, my wife's fledgling company where she makes beautiful, modest, simple, elegant Catholic dresses for girls. Little girls, slightly bigger girls, teenage girls, kind of. 
Check her out on Etsy.com. Search Our Lady's Closet. And don't forget, at Our Lady's Closet on Instagram and Facebook. You won't be disappointed. I promise. All right. Beer in hand. Mouse in hand. Slogan on my lips. Never give up. Keep on smiling. And memento mori. Until next time.